Well, let's actually just get started. People will join in when they when they do here. Um, and uh, oh, yep, yeah, we got Rachel. Uh, well, welcome, folks. So I'm John Bussey. I'm the marketing manager with Lifetime Foundation, and one of the things that I get to do uh, is oversee the uh, Lifetime Foundation team, along with Nate Moen. Nate's also on the call here. Um, we're thrilled to have you all. And so if you on this call are even competing on and a bunch of different events this coming year. Some starting with Miami uh, in just a few weeks time. Others, Leadville, New York City, Big Sugar, kind of all over the place. Um, we've only got half an hour, uh, so I'm gonna get to it as quickly as possible here. Uh, but we hope to have a couple of these sessions throughout the spring. Uh, this one we are pleased, all of which will be in, in collaboration with Boundless, uh, which is an amazing coaching service based in Boulder. Uh, that has tons of experience with um, all the races that Lifetime puts on. So I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Deanna Ardry here. Uh, I'm not going to take too much time. I know I provided a bit of her bio in the um, in the intro here or in the in the invitation. Uh, but I'd love for Deanna to know a little bit about the people who are here. So as I've passed over, if you could in the meeting chat, just write your name and an event or the events rather uh, that you're going to be taking part in this coming year. So Deanna knows a little bit about that. Uh, she's got about a 15 minute presentation here. And then we're going to switch in question and answer for the final 15 minutes. Uh, we'll do that again through the chat. So you'll be able to enter whatever questions you have through the chat. And then Ryan Kroll, who's on the line with us here as well, who runs Boundless Coaching, uh, will be able to synthesize those questions and then have that conversation with Deanna. Um, so without further ado, uh, super thrilled to pass it over to Deanna. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Yeah, my name's Deanna Ardry, and like John said, I'm a coach for Boundless. Um, so if you're not familiar with Boundless, I encourage you to check out our website and see some of the other coaches on there and what we're about. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you guys about tapering, hydration, nutrition, and pacing. Um, so yeah, I'm going to uh, go over this 15 minute presentation and then if any of you guys have questions, I just ask that you save them for the end. We'll have a 15 minute um, section afterwards to, for questions. So I made this little presentation. Hopefully you all can see it. Well, let me see. All right, tapering. Why is tapering important? Tapering allows for full recovery before the race. Um, you, during the tapering phase, you begin to restore your depleted glycogen and hormones. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay. And then you arrive to the starting line fresh and ready. Um, it's important to start your, I usually um, suggest that athletes start their taper uh, two weeks out. Some people start it three weeks out, but I think two weeks is the um, sweet spot. Um, just because uh, athletes tend to get a little antsy when they taper too far out because you're used to running all this mileage and then you significantly cut back. Um, so just remember that the hay is in the barn and at this point less is more. Um, and that you're not going to reap any fitness benefits or gains by trying to train up into the marathon. Recovery is part of training, so make sure to take that tapering phase um, serious. So what does tapering look like? I put together an example of what a, ta a tapering block would look like for one of my athletes. Now again, I just want you guys to know that this is an, a sample and no one runner is the same. So what works for someone may not work for someone else. Everyone has different lifestyles, careers, kids, no kids, whatever. And some people are more novice runners and others are expert runners. So again, <laughs> don't take this and think it's going to work for you. But this is just an example. So say you're an athlete who is running 80 to 90 miles a week leading up into to your marathon. This would be an example of a taper for someone running that higher mileage. So on Monday, you would do an easy run and you're still doing, you're still running as you see, you're not taking like 
total time off, you still want to keep the legs moving. It's just significantly reduced. So on Tuesday, you would still do a shortened workout. Um, with I have a warm up four by three minute intervals with 90 second recovery. So it's a small workout. Wednesday, you'd still do a medium distance run. And then you really begin to taper as we go forward with Thursday, just 45 minutes, Friday an hour, Saturday off. And then Sunday would be your last long run before the marathon at 90 minutes. And then the week of the marathon, you really begin to taper off. With Tuesday, you have again, sh a short interval workout, but it's only at 80% effort. So you're not out there killing it. You're just out there getting the blood flowing, the legs moving um, with a six by one minute repeat with two minute recovery at 80% effort. And then as you can see Thursday, you would, that would typically be your travel day if you're traveling to Miami and you'd take that day off. Friday, you would do a short run with a couple strides and then Saturday you'd completely rest because the following day would be your marathon. All right. So what do you do with all that extra time? Well, for some of you with kids, you don't have a lot of extra time, but if you're running high mileage and it's significantly reduced, um, you do have extra time. So how would you spend that? Um, get a massage, eat all those carbs to fuel up those glycogen stores and get the muscles ready. Study the race course. This is really important when you're running a new course, new marathon you've never run before. It's important to know where are the aid stations at? Where are the hills? Where are the mile markers? And, mo and it, most importantly, where are the port johns um, You wanna know your race plan. What are you gonna have for breakfast race morning? How are you getting to and from the race? What's your pacing strategy? What's your nutrition and hydration gonna look like? What are you gonna wear? What's your racing kit? Um, do you have mantras that you're gonna say during the race? And then of course, rest. And um, just a side note, when I brought up the race kit thing, it's important not to wear brand new shoes on race day. Wear something that you've done a couple runs in. The worst thing you can do is put on those brand new, fresh looking shoes, and then you end up with a bunch of blisters and pain, and you have 26 miles to run in those shoes. Um, and same thing with the race kit. Practice what you're gonna wear um, during your training runs. And also make sure when you go to the race, um, you wanna have throw away gloves, arm warmers, extra hair ties, things like that, that you need to plan ahead for. Um, anyways, so back to the nutrition piece of that first. So for race morning, I usually recommend setting the al your alarm three hours before the race. That way you can get in your calories then, and you can go back to bed afterwards, um, but you wanna set the alarm three hours before the race, aim for 300 to 400 calories, Make sure that they're slow release carbs, um, which is another word for complex carbs. Those are absorbed much slowly, much more slowly, so you don't get a huge insulin spike. Um, let's see. Here's some examples of complex carbs. We have bagels, oatmeal, um, breakfast burrito with beans and eggs, sweet potatoes, quinoa. Um, I usually go for the bagel in the morning with cream cheese. I set my alarm three hours before, eat that, and go back to bed. Or there's beer. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Boo running, yay, beer. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so hydration and nutrition. It's important to practice your hydration and nutrition in your training. Again, don't show up to race day and do something new. Um, so with that being said, if you're not gonna use your own nutrition, you need to know what the race provides on course and you need to practice with that in your training. Um, you don't wanna show up to race day and take something you've never taken before and end up with GI issues, um, getting sick, um, things like that. So uh, if you are gonna run with your own nutrition, how are you gonna carry it? I always um, recommend using pins on the inside of your shorts to carry your gels. Um, but again, there's no cookie cutter approach to 
what you use for hydration and nutrition. Every athlete is different, so make sure you practice in your training. And how often do you take a gel? It's recommended to use gels every 30 to 45 minutes. When you're taking a gel, remember that it's not being stored for later use. It's so that it's to prevent you from having that crash from bonking. So you want to take it before you reach that point where you're beginning to bonk. So every 30 to 45 minutes is what is recommended. And make sure that you're using gels that you've used in practice. Some of them have caffeine, which you know could cause GI issues. So do you want ones with uh, caffeine in them or not? Um, some of them are, go down really easy. Some of them are really gooey and sticky and they're hard to swallow. So make sure you practice. Um, let's see. And now we're on to pacing. So pacing, it's very important. We're not, do not go out too fast, okay? You are going to pay for it later. I know we arrived to the start line and we're really excited and we have the crowd around you and the people are all there sta uh, standing and cheering, watching their loved ones take off. And it's so easy to get caught up, especially because you feel good those first couple miles. But if you do take off early, you are going to be paying for it later. So we're not Usain Bolt here. <laughs> we're uh, endurance runners, so you want to maintain that pace over the long distance. Um, so make sure you are going. It should feel easy at first. Um, so there are different pacing methods, and it's good to have a plan and know what you're going to do. Uh, most marathons do offer pacers for different different race time finishes. So when you get to a race and you're looking at where you want to line up in the um, race start, you can always look for the person with the sign that holds that says the uh, marathon race finish time and just find that person and try to stick with them the whole race. Um, you can make sure you calculate your splits ahead of time, have a plan, know what you should be running per mile or per 5k, 10k, so on. Um, use a GPS watch, which is what I usually do. Um, but just be aware that they can get wonky, especially if you're in a bigger city or around a lot of other people using GPS watches. Sometimes it takes a while for them to work correctly. You can, you know, be running and it won't start working correctly until you hit around 5k mark. Um, so just make sure you have a backup plan. And then again, practice pacing in your training. Um, oh, another thing, if you are going to write down your splits, you can write them on a tape and you can either stick it on your arm or stick it on your shirt or someplace where you can reference it throughout the marathon. So a way to find out what your splits are, if you're not sure how to do that, you can Google search, um, you know, running pace calculator. And this is just one example. There's tons of different um, pace calculators on the internet, but this is one from Strava. And I'm not sure if the typing on this is pretty small, but you can see if you were gonna run a six minute mar uh, mile, seven minute, eight minute, and so on, it tells you per mile what you should be at. Um, and this only goes up to half marathon, but it does go farther. I just didn't want to put two slides of this up. And then last but not least, mantras. Mantras are really important because running 26 miles is hard. No matter how um, well trained you are, you're going to hit rough patches um, up and down. So it's important to have things to say to yourself that kind of help motivate you and keep you pushing along. So I just wrote down a couple here for you guys to use, or if you have others that you want to share at the end here, I'd love to hear them. But don't think, just run is a favorite one of mine. I am strong. Pain is temporary. Or another one of mine that's a favorite is one more mile, because I have to keep reminding myself to just get through one mile at a time rather than thinking as at, of the race as a whole 26 miles. So I think that's it. Yep, that is all. We finished a little bit early, so a little bit more time for questions. <laughs> that's brilliant, Diana. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. I do You're love welcome. your comment too. Uh, uh, so for the next section here, we got 15 minutes for question and answer. I think the best way to do this um, 
is to have people write questions into into the chat and then Ryan, who's on the line here, who okay. runs Boundless, will kind of have that conversation with Deanna, taking the questions that he's pulling out of the chat uh, and then asking Deanna. So when you're ready, Ryan, I'll turn it on over to you and for everyone else on the line, feel free to start tossing the questions you have into, into the chat box. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and kick this off while, while these questions are coming through. One that I had was um, just about timing of massage. You mentioned massage. I've heard of like folks getting flat if they do it like too close to the marathon. Do you have a suggestion on like timing for when to get a, a, a massage? Yeah, I would recommend getting it at least four days prior or or even two weeks before. But if you do it too close to the marathon, again, you want to make sure you're drinking lots of fluids afterwards and, um, you know, making sure that you're flushing out any toxins that were released during the massage and that um, you're feeling good for a race day morning. So, yeah, it is important. You don't want to do the massage the day before the race. Do it a few days before so that, again, you're not showing up to the line feeling unlike yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we just had a question, looks like from Max. Um, how do you recommend training your stomach to increase calorie intake while running? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Again, you don't need to take in a lot. Um, you just need to be smart about what you're taking in. Um, and you should be practicing this. Again, you shouldn't, I mean, you're not going to be running a marathon and taking in um, I hopefully not eating huge like cliff bars or anything like that. They're little gels that should be easy to consume. And as far as drinking, I mean, I know Miami, it can be hot and humid there. So you're probably going to, your fluid intake is going to be more, but remember you're also sweating a lot and losing a lot. So again, practice during your training is really important. Um, what works well with your stomach? Some people, for me, I have to water down my Gatorade. If I'm drinking Gatorade, I can't drink straight Gatorade. It's too sugary. Um, and make sure that when you are taking those drinks, you're doing sips, but I want to gulp an entire Gatorade drink at one stop because then you do risk it jostling around and giving you stomach issues. So frequently, less and more frequently on the hydration. Good. Yeah, um, just reading through the comments, Max, is his focus event is Leadville, which is a little bit different than a road marathon in that your heart rate's higher during a road marathon, so it's harder to take in more calories. So that, that will be a different type of nutrition training. Just to... Yeah, and your duration of running is much longer, so you're going to be eating a lot more. You, I mean, I think in Leadville 100, people are eating like slices of pizza. So you're not doing that in a marathon. <laughs> I mean, you could. Um, our next question from C. Dunn is, how do you recommend adjusting nutrition for heat acclimatization uh, leading up to the race and during? Yeah, that's a great question, especially for this marathon. Like I said, um, Miami Marathon, it's bound to be hot and humid. So you want to again, practice in your training, but you want to, you're going to be taking in a lot more, um, hydration because you, it's your way, your body's way of cooling its system down and, uh, making sure everything is working properly. Um, and that you're not, you know, getting cramps from dehydration. So again, practice in your training, but yeah, you are going to want to be Drinking. I think I'm getting off track. What was the question again? <laughs> this was for um, to acclimate for heat. To acclimate for heat. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you how do you adjust your training to acclimate for heat, um, leading up to the race and then during the race? Well, again, and if you don't live in a climate that's hot and humid, where you're you're already training in that environment, then I would suggest running with layers on. Um, I mean, I know they're the Japanese team out here in Boulder, Colorado do heat training and they, you'll see them in the summertime wearing long pants, long sleeve shirts, just to get used to running in that heat. So there's different methods you could try, 
but again, you want to practice that in your training. And yeah, it is, it is different to be running in a hot and humid environment. So whatever you can do, whether that's wearing more layers in your training, doing some of your runs inside um, on a treadmill where you can control that um, temperature environment, um, especially you know, leading into Miami Marathon, if you live in a colder climate like here in Boulder, um, we've been having, you know, snow and you're training through the snow and cold temperature. So it is important to not go from cold snow to hot and humid without being prepared for that. So. Yeah, and I'll, I'll piggyback on that too, that like 50 degrees has been proven to, to produce the fastest times right around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then it's just going to decrease as it gets warmer. So if you're looking at an 80 plus degree day, it's always good to adjust your goals too. And that's where perceived effort comes in and, and monitoring your heart rate because you're not going to most likely run a PR when it's, you know, 80 degrees. Um, and then just to be prepared for anything like the year I ran Miami, it rained and was cold all <laughs> the whole time. So yeah. it's a total crapshoot. <laughs> the marathon can be a total crapshoot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like this question uh, from Cameron. What motivated you to start running seriously, and has that changed over time? Um, for me, I mean, everyone's story is different. I I never ran in high school or college, although I was an athlete. Um, but post college, I wanted to stay fit. And I found running when I moved out here to Boulder. And it was just kind of a hidden talent that I didn't know I had. And I fell in love with the sport. So for me, it's not just a goal of one and done. It's kind of a lifestyle. And I am a runner and I'll always be a runner. And that's not going to change even as my life does change. And I now have a career and I'm a coach and I'm a mother and I'm a partner and life gets really hectic and busy, but I still find time to run, even if it's only 30 minutes a day and, and competing will, will always be a piece of that because for me, if I don't have a goal or something I'm working towards, it's just not as exciting and I can tend to, um, not be quite as motivated so I, even though I'm a coach, I still work with a coach because if I start to slack, he'll check in with me and make sure that I'm keeping up my end of the deal. So yeah, I mean, I, I love the sport. That's probably why I continue to do it. It's my passion. Running is my passion. So yeah, there's my baby. <laughs> Um, I'll touch on your question, Oliver, choose. Okay. I think it goes back to, to what we were talking with nutrition before on, uh, yeah, you just practice, you know, choose, choose are a little bit harder to get down, especially when you're, when you're trying to run, um, a marathon and, and your pace might be a little bit faster and your heart rate might be a little bit higher. Um, I think that's why most people gravitate towards choose or some sort of like liquid calories, just because it's easier to take in. Um, I have a question for you, Deanna, just so we can learn from your mistakes. What has been your biggest mistake, either like in a taper, in training, or um, leading up to a race? What did you, if you could go back in time and, and change something? Um, well, two things. First, I'm going to answer this in two different ways. So one of the biggest mistakes I've made is having unreal, unrealistic expectations and then setting myself up, setting myself up to where I have a race with unrealistic expectations. And then I end up really depressed and unhappy for a while because I didn't live up to my expectations. So I think it's really important to know, you know, the training you've done and what you should be able to accomplish with it. I think it's it's important to dream big and have high ambitions, but when you go into a marathon, you know the training you did to get there and it's important to be realistic with what outcome you're gonna have. Um, 
And remember, too, at the end of the day, although I do love running, it's just running. And there's so much more to life. So don't let one race define who you are. That's another thing I learned in my career is, you you know, I'm not as good as – there's a saying that athletes have is your, that is, you're only as good as your last race. Well, I'm here to tell you that's BS. Like, life is so much more than running. Um, but, again, have realistic expectations. And then the second way I want to answer this is that um, when I was younger, I wasn't as smart about my nutrition. It's really important. And I've gone into races where with an unhealthy mindset of, uh, and I think the sport is getting better, but there's a lot of issues within the sport of um, looking a certain way, being a certain weight, so on and so forth. And Again, there's a, some really strong, amazing women out there who are breaking those barriers um, of what a runner should look like. Um, but when I was younger, I would make the mistake of not fueling correctly, um, which is stupid. So it's important, to, I think, if you don't know how to fuel correctly and you've learned maybe a little bit from this um, presentation, but there's so much you can learn. I encourage you to um, link up with a nutritionist um, dietitians if you're struggling on that end. That's great. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions? Um, otherwise, I think. I think we're looking good. Uh, Ryan, I think that last one, that last question of yours was kind of an excellent one to wrap up on. Um, thank you for that. And Deanna, that's awesome. Thank you for both sharing like the, uh, I mean, both the, the nuts and bolts and kind of the basics of it is cool, but I think maybe even better is hearing your own perspective on the things that have challenged you all the time. Um, so folks, uh, that's it for this. Uh, after this wraps up, I'm going to, we've been recording this. I'm going to share it out with all the 75 foundation athletes that we have scattered across the country at this point. Um, so feel free to refer back to it. Um, we're also working with Ryan and a few other coaches to be putting together some similar webinar sessions to this over the, over the coming, uh, over the coming spring on, uh, especially those that then transition to looking more at, uh, 100 mile stuff, altitude, triathlon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and some of those, they'll be coming up uh, down the road. And I should say both on the running and biking side there. Uh, so expect that to, to be coming down the pipeline. Uh, if you want to learn more about Boundless, so uh, we don't, Fund, Lifetime Foundation doesn't have the expertise to share as much as we'd love to on the coaching front. However, Boundless is an amazing source. They're the recommended um, coaching service of the Leadville 100 series and so absolutely if you're interested in hooking up with them uh they've got coaches that can help you and uh I'll, I'll share their email as well obviously no obligation to do so and they do stuff like this for us because they like the organization but it is who we recommend as well um that's all for for now thank you so much for joining us ryan diana thanks so much and we'll uh we'll see you all again again later take care awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Thanks, John. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you.